Almost the Lazy Bee Equine Rescue and Sanctuary, and really looking forward to seeing their plays, seeing what they're doing out here. According to social media, they're doing amazing things. Yeah, um, yeah. Kelsey and Gunner are awesome people. When we were doing the workshop, you know, I was watching all the different organizations, and they were all very engaged in the workshop and 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 learning. But I, she had her laptop out and was just typing it and was listening very intently. And from what, what we can see on social media. They're really implementing everything that they were able to learn and just running with it. Um, I've seen a lot better fundraising on their end. Um, one of the horses they recently rescued had extremely long hooves. We're trying to build a network of horse rescues across the United States that will accept horses regardless of their condition, regardless of their adoptability, because that's the only way slaughter is going to end, is we have to stop supplying the slaughter pipeline through rescues turning horses away. You got a beautiful place here. Thank you, thank you. We've been doing a lot of work out here. <laughs> yeah, a lot of work, for sure. Y'all definitely yeah. been busy since the workshop. Yeah. With social media, from watching. I'm yeah. like, shoot, well, they're working good. their tails off. Well, yeah, we'd, we've been uh, posting a lot more, which is actually, it's brought in a lot of, of uh, views on our nice. on our page, and also we have like 2,000 more followers than we did. So. More, more donations? <laughs> a lot more, more donations. donations, awesome. yes. Yeah. Awesome. Yep, it's been wonderful. My name is Kelsey Bjorkland, and I'm the Executive Director of Lazy Bee Equine Rescue and Sanctuary of Utah. 
I'd love to get a tour of your facility and, and see, see this amazing place you have here. Yeah, awesome. Um, we can start in the barn. Lazy Bee Equine Rescue and Sanctuary um, was founded in 2017. We are an all um, full circle of life horse shelter where we rescue all horses and equines, donkeys, minis, ponies um, that come our way. We have two facilities. This is um, kind of more of our rehab and sanctuary facility, um, but we'll give you a tour of this one first and then later on we'll head over to our um, Clinton location and give you a tour of that one. From what I can see, your facility is amazing already, so I'm excited to see more. What sets us apart is that we are trying to prepare the public for long-term horse care. Um, we have an education program that sets potential owners or current owners up for success. We take our rehabilitated horses and we make sure they're healthy, they're, they're ready to be rehomed. And then within our education program, we provide basic horsemanship, riding both English and Western. We teach about um, horse health and how to identify lameness. We teach about basically anything horses as well as proper feeding. If the horses can and they're healthy enough to be out on the pasture, then we'd like to keep them out there since it's more natural for them. Um, if we have horses that do need kind of extensive care, then we'll stall them usually in the front stall since it's bigger and it's, it's not so contained and they can see the rest of the horses out there. Feeding is something that we oftentimes see owners struggling with and that's probably besides farrier um, is our biggest intake that, that uh, we have to rehabilitate horses for. So we definitely strive to educate the public to make sure that we aren't rescuing their horses later on in life. This barn has 12 stalls total. The last stall down here at the end is a uh, double stall, so I guess technically there's 11 stalls total, but we could put a wall if we wanted to. But we keep that stall for our brood mares in case we have any in, we can put them in there. My name is Gunnar Bjorklund, and I am the assistant director of Lazy Bee Equine Rescue and Sanctuary. And all these stalls in here were awesome for the winter months when it was colder. We also had a lot of flooding outside of here. Um, we're pretty close to the Great Salt Lake, um, so it's very swampy, we get a lot of water. Lots so we could have all of our horses in here in the wintertime, they could all be dry, um, you know, out of the rain, out of the cold. On a daily basis, I pick up hay, I unload hay, um, I drive the skid steer and pull bales out, uh, big bales out for the pasture horses, uh, constantly fixing fences, fixing anything. I also do some training, a lot of desensitizing. I don't do a whole lot of like breaking horses. Um, our main goal is to get them to be able to tie, pick up all four feet, load in a trailer and back out of a trailer successful. And that to us is successfully training them to move on to their forever home. Do you have a lot of West Nile here with all the mosquitoes? Recently, there's been a, a few cases kind of in our area, um, but not, not necessarily like with an hour County. There haven't been a lot of cases, but within like Utah and Idaho itself, just within the last, I think, two years, yeah. it has been, yeah. Well, both Gunnar and I, we, we do sort of um, divvy up the day-to-day -day operations just because it, there is so much. I feed the horses, we water them, we scrub out the water buckets, we exercise the horses, we do all of our own training on site. There's a lot of socializing with the horses. I also teach lessons five days a week from very early in the morning to until about after the sun comes down. Gunnar works his own nine to five, so during the day, um, the majority of the operations is on me to kind of coordinate, but after Gunnar's off work of his own work, then he comes and helps me too. So I've always rescued horses and animals, pretty much, and sometimes people, um, within my life. And so when we started in 2017, it was mostly from one of our local classifieds where there were just handfuls and handfuls and so many free or very cheap horses for $50 or $100. And I know what happens to those horses. They they fall into the wrong hands or they fall into kill buyers' hands and those, those kill buyers take them to kill lots or to the auction and then the horses get put into the slaughter pipeline. If I can apply my knowledge base that I have to being able to assist the, the animals that are, you know, are at risk, then that's what I, it kind of drives me every day. You got a lot of misters in here. It feels really nice. I bet the horses like it. Yeah, the misters are a must uh, when it gets so hot in here. Uh, we'd like to have the misters on. We have a big fan over there that's running that's very squeaky right now that I need to fix the squeaky because Kelsey is going to lose her mind in here with the squeaky fan. <laughs> 
Uh, but yeah, the misters are amazing, and I hopefully I can install more soon. Uh, but I actually we just put these up last week, I think, mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. So, yeah, but they're week. a lifesaver. So the workshop that Gunnar and I attended in May was beyond our expectations. We learned a lot about nutrition. We learned a lot about, um, you know, compassion fatigue, because before we had attended, we were, both Gunnar and I were sort of, you know, we're feeling burnt out. We didn't, we were just kind of going through the motions throughout the day. But when we left, we were like, okay, here's this fire again. Like we've got it. We, we have more resources than we did before. We have this beautiful connection of rescues all around the U.S. Really, it was just great to know that there's other organizations out there like us, especially other organizations that are successful by following the mission and sticking to your, you know, your key, your key points is really what's important. You know, good things will happen if you if you follow your mission. This barn used to be for breeding and training racehorses. So, out in the pasture, when we go out there, you'll see there's a. There's a divot uh, okay. of the racetrack out There's there. The racetrack. Mm. So. Well, before we attended the workshop, we didn't really have a, a big volunteer base. Now we do, thankfully. So um, some of the feeding and watering duties and cleaning the stalls has been um, moved over to some of our volunteers. So if I'm if I'm gone and Gunner's gone and we're not able to physically do it ourselves or if we're sick, um, like right after we went to the workshop, I got COVID and so it was... Um, right when we started to revamp our our volunteer program so it was kind of <laughs> kind of a, a complicated couple of days you could say and um, we have a chat where all of our feeding and watering volunteers are all in and so um, we have really good communication within that so if somebody's unable to cover their feeding or watering shift then another volunteer that's been trained to do it can come in and and kind of pop in and um and make sure the horses are, are good and fed. And Audrey's been wonderful. She's filled in a lot of times. <laughs> I get up and volunteer because I love volunteering. I've been volunteering at uh, Animal Rescue since I was 18, I'm 25 now. So I've mostly been volunteering at cat and dog rescues, but it's just something that I, I love volunteering. It gives me a really sense of fulfillment in my life. I'm Addie Cook and I volunteer and I'm also one of the writers here. I just think it's a super great place. All the people are so nice here. Kelsey and what Gunnar have going rescuing the horses is so great and I'm so glad I can be a little part of it. Now that we've seen all the stalls, we have um, a tack room in our hay storage area back here. Um, so we can go peek in here. Gunnar spent a lot of hours and a lot of time putting the tack room together. We had to um, clean it and repaint it and then we put up all of the like the hangers and all of the um, yeah. the saddle racks you know just being able to meet with other rescues and see how they do something versus how we operate when you, you know when you get stuck in your your daily routine it's hard to think of you know is there other ways that are more efficient th to do this or like maybe there's a different way we can bring income in so it kind of just you know relit our fire for rescue so here is our tack room and pretty much all of this is tack that's been donated to us. So we're hoping eventually we can use this as a uh, place where uh, members of the public can come and purchase tack at an affordable price, you know, or if somebody adopts a horse, yeah. they can, you know, say, hey, go pick something out from the tack room. What's your community involvement? Like if this is all donated, I'm assuming from this area. But Utah has a pretty big horse community and so a lot of the tack that has been donated either comes from the local um, counties or uh, we ha we've had a few from Salt Lake as well. Um, but people that go through their tack, like in the spring and the, the fall, they like to give us their tack, which a lot of it has been very useful to us as well, especially with our um, the lesson program that we have. So we've seen a huge increase in donations. Um, just within the last, I think, four weeks, we've brought in about $8,000 in donations. And that's more than we ever thought we could have come in in one month. So it definitely helps fuel us a little bit to to keep sharing the horses' stories and, and it, just to introduce them to everybody. And it helps for sure. So lesson program, tell me a little bit about that. So our lesson program is um, an affordable um, equine education and lesson program to the public. Um, it's $35 per session. We start teaching at age three all the way up to adults. Um, I teach it myself, which is fun because I get to make sure that everybody is given the information that I think horse owners need, which it helps prevent um, horses needing to be rescued in the future if they have the, the information and they're provided with the proper care and handling of horses. Um, but yeah, we teach five days a week from 7.30 in the morning to 8.30 at night. And it's it's been very beneficial for the community. 
That's a really neat program and something I've been like wishing we could implement at our own organization because if we're not training the public how to take care of horses and and stuff like it's just going to the cycle's just going to repeat. Um, we are working with our current school system to try to develop a program like that and they're pretty excited oh, about cool. it. So as your program grows, it might be something that you can get your local school involved in. We do have a couple of 4-H programs that come and visit and do some like volunteer service hours with us. Um, but the school, we do have a few um, students in our program actually that their parents are teachers. So that's actually a great idea. We could connect with them and see if they can do like field trips or implement an equine program with them. With the school that we're working with, I told them that we could even bring like a little miniature horse into the classroom and they just ate that up. Like, they're like, wow, that would be amazing. Sometimes people bring dogs and cats mm -hmm. into education, but like never a horse. Right. For the Full Circle of Life Horse Shelter, we have not said no to a single horse. So while that's really scary to us and very, um, it, like with the surrender intakes or surrender requests that we get, we ha we're sitting at probably 17 a week. So the intake fee has, it's made a really big difference. Um, we've also been telling a lot of the owners who need help um, to also maybe to see if there's family members that might be able to help house the animals while they wait to get the intake fee, all while still not saying no. <laughs> Obviously we're not taking all of those horses. Um, we have said yes to all of them, but some owners are not able to pay the surrender fee. If an owner's not able to pay the surrender fee, you know, we, we tell them it, it doesn't mean that no, we can't take them. It just means that we can maybe help fundraise for the intake fees, or maybe they can, they would have panels or something of that value that they could bring with the animals that we might be able to sell to help bring in that income so that we can ensure the horses are seen right away. On this side of the barn, we have, we've been using this as our quarantine area over here. We'd like to separate this out so we can have two or three different pens in here. And then there's a gate down there at the end. So we could potentially back a trailer up and just push them out into the quarantine area. So this is something we're, we're working on, but it's worked really well when we've gotten two or three horses in that need to be quarantined. We can put them in here and you know nobody else can touch them. So we do get some from animal control. Um, they seize them and then they bring them to us, such as the Mustangs. Um, that was a neglect case we got them from. So I recognize these horses from social media, but tell me the story about them. Like, it's pretty crazy. Like, I know one of them's a Mustang. Are they both Mustangs? Yes, they're both uh, Mustangs out of the Cedar Mountain um, BLM range. Um, this one over here is Piper. Piper was the worst of the two. They were. Um, they were both kept in a very small round pen um, and they they just were not taken care of. They were very, very much neglected. Um, and we know that based on their feet and um, kind of their body, not their body scores, but kind of their body condition. Um, Dakota here has, she's very sweet, but she has kind of some spinal remodification going on that the vet is unsure uh, kind of what the cause Sorry. might be or kind of what her outcome will be. Um, and then Piper over here, her hooves, we, we cut about eight to eight to nine inches off of her feet and we weighed it and it was a total of, of about six pounds. Wow. Yeah. These are Piper's feet. Piper's feet that were trimmed and we actually had to cut these with a, uh, well, they started with a grinder, but the grinder ran out of battery. So I had to go get my Sawzall and we cut these off with the Sawzall and they estimated this is probably a year and a half of growth right here. Um, you know, depending on if any of this chipped off before that. Um, and they were they were probably curved up like that, right about there. So she was really hard to walk. Um, and we took those off and it took her, took her about a day to figure out how to walk again. You know, she was still walking back on her heels. And then finally, after a day, she was able to walk up on her foot like normal. Wow. But I mean, they're very friendly. They, they uh, warmed up very quickly to us. Do you think they were just like adopted from the BLM and just lived that however many years in that round pen, just never getting hoof care? Um, so something think? similar, yeah. So what we were told by the animal control officer that contacted us about them to help, um, she said that, that they were adopted off the BLM land as yearlings together. Um, and they are about five and six years old. 
Um, and then they were just kept in that little tiny round pen. It was probably a 30, 30 foot round pen together that whole time. Um, they did say that they're broke to ride, which I mean, based on their their friendly personalities, I would believe it, but based their on feet. the, yeah, their yeah. feet, it's, I mean, Piper hadn't been trimmed in probably about a year and a half. Were they good with their feet? Or were they? Um, they were, were okay. Wow. Yeah. It's always so sad when there's a horse that is okay to have its feet done by a farrier to get in that condition. Dakota was actually really easy. She um, stood really well for the farrier, even with the grinder, didn't really seem that big of a deal for her. So uh, we did her feet and didn't do a whole lot of work. We mainly took off all the overgrowth. And then our farrier basically said, let's just leave them like this. And he is gonna come back in two weeks. We will get them some x-rays and have the vets check them out and see if there's any any other issues they find. It's gonna be a quite a long road to look, recovery for them. You know, if the veterinary checks everything out and everything looks good, it's still gonna be a long ways for them to be able to walk like a normal horse again. And just knowing that whoever had them before could have just paid 50 bucks for a farrier to come out and trim them. And that's all they had to do. It's like, it's so easy to, ne to neglect horses, um, but also so easy to not neglect them. We'll have radiographs done on her, I believe it's in a week and a half, so soon. Um, but yeah, she's already walking like more forward <laughs> and more willing to, to actually walk instead of just be really hesitant, and she was actually kind of frolicky last night, which was really cute to watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So over here, we call this our Mustang pasture. Um, we had a couple of Mustangs that that needed some some outside um, kind of interaction with other horses, but they we didn't quite trust them yet um, to be out in the big pasture with the rest of them. So it's kind of our containment confinement area but allowing horses to still have their natural interaction behaviors. This is a nice turnout pasture too, because you don't have to chase horses all over that big pasture. We want the horses. <laughs> we want to help them. We want, um, we want to be able to make a difference in, in their lives. And if the last act of kindness is, is in their future, then I mean, I, I want to be able to do that for that horse. It's acceptable, you know, we, we always thought it was like, it's, it's a horrible thing to do. And yes, it's horrible, but at the same time, it's, it's good. There's, there's worse things in life than death. And that's something that we, um, one of our, our veterinarians told us um, when we first started rescuing horses and that's kind of stuck with us this whole time. And um, even explaining that to, to clients and to followers, um, once you say that, they're like, oh yeah, I get it. We sort of already follow the, the beginning to end life cycle of the, of the horses. Um, also being able to have the network of Full Circle of Life um, organizations across the US, I think is incredible. It's like an amazing idea <laughs> because everybody within the network is following the same philosophy and, um, and, and we all have the same goal is to, to you know, help as many horses as we can. This pasture here is used for more of our sanctuary horses as well as some turnout. Uh, you can see Midnight coming up right here. He is a uh, off the track thoroughbred. He just got injections in his knee. Hey buddy. About a week ago. And he is six years old? He's eight. Eight years old. Hi bud. And he is very friendly. Aww. When we, when he was surrendered over to us, they originally said that his uh, vet diagnosis was that he needed to be euthanized because he had a, a big bone chip that was floating around in his knee. But um, with his vet visit last week, they did radiographs and they said that it's since been fused back Good. together a little bit. And Good. so his, his uh, lifelong plan is a lot better than it was originally. Good, so, that's wonderful. Yeah. So, well, that was most of this facility here with the barn and then our um, pastures and our quarantine area. Um, but let's head over to the other location. Awesome. Lazy Bee Equine Rescue and Sanctuary is a, a great facility from what we've seen so far. They do have another facility, so we're gonna take about a 10 minute drive and go see their other facility and get to know the founders a little better. Hey, Hello. so this is the other location. Yes, this is our second location where we do all of our lessons and where the majority of our adoptable horses are. Awesome, well, I'd love to see more of it. Hey. 
How many acres do you have here? Um, in total, we have about eight. Okay. And how many horses roughly on those eight acres? It definitely fluctuates, but at the kind of the average of it at the moment, we have between 30 and 34. Yeah, tell me about this area. Yes, so we're walking through, this is um, our lesson arena. Um, it's where we teach all, the majority of our, um, our writing with our equine education classes, as well as um, where we ride our personal horses as well. Okay, so who do we have over here? This is Cookies. She is our tiniest horse that we have. She's a 16 year old miniature horse. Aww. <laughs> She's not as sweet as she looks. She's been pretty good so far. She's been pretty good. Yeah. When it comes feeding time, she's... Yeah, then she gets kind of cranky. Yeah. Keep the food away from her. Yeah. So over here we have our round pen. This is where we do a lot of our, um, like our desensitizing training. If we have a lot of horses that just need socializing, we'll move them over to here and let a lot of our volunteers do some socializing. We also incorporate a lot of that into our um, lesson program as well, so that they sort of get a feel for how to um, handle and, and care for and touch the horses that need a little bit of extra attention. And a big thing that we teach is just existing with the horses. A lot of them have either had past traumas or um, existing traumas that they still have yet to overcome. So we'll kind of stick them in here and it gives them an enclosed space, but it also gives them the room and freedom to kind of move around as well. So over here we have our barn, tack barn. Uh, we keep our hay and our grain as well as all of our tack for our lesson program. Well, it's great to have two different facilities. One can be more quiet, intake, quarantine. Yeah. Yeah, quiet lessons, and then you have your hubbub yeah. here. <laughs> yep, and this is where most of the volunteers and most of the happenings kind of happen here. You said you have an equine massage therapist coming in? We do. Um, we have Kylie Harris with um, SZ Massage, or Equine Massage Therapy. Um, she went to school in Florida for it, and um, she, um, just to kind of get her hands going, and you know, she wants to give back to the horses, so she donates her time to um, massage some of our horses, and I think she's gonna work on Miss Rebel today. So Rebel was an owner's surrender. Um, she was born and raised with the family that, that surrendered her over. Um, she's a huge puppy dog. <laughs> loves to be scratched, loves to lick the humans, which is sort of funny. Um, but she ha has some founder issues going on, and so she's been consistently lame um, over the last year or so. So um, she was their last horse, and they asked us to take her because they didn't have the means to financially care for her, and they couldn't give her a job because she was lame. So they decided that she would be better off here. She's very sweet, though. She's a huge goofball. She's kind of dirty, though. Do you want a brush? Yeah, oh, don't mind. Oh, you're just a little bit dirty. Hi, baby. What do we think? Hi. My name is Kylie Harris. Um, I am the owner, founder of SZ Equine Massage Therapy. I have been a volunteer with Lazy Beef for five to six years. Um, I donate some of my time to do massages for all of their horses, especially intakes um, as we get horses in then kind of help do assessments and start kick off the rehab process on a good note. And then I actually also have taken lessons with Lazy Bee for a few years as well. So I went to school um, at the Animal Rehab Institute based in Wellington, Florida for my massage therapy. Um, I am a certified equine massage therapist through them. Um, it was kind of a hybrid course, so I did spend some time out in Wellington studying, doing hands-on, getting certified. Always had an affinity for animals, always absolutely adored horses, and it's one of the most effective and critical, in my opinion, uh, not being biased, but one of the most amazing simple things that you can do to give back to a horse. I practice with Masterson Method. Um, so I focus on 25 main points that are kind of a main stress point, pressure point for each horse for my first assessment. And I'll kind of build off of that depending on each horse, how they react, their injuries, their disciplines, kind of what their day-to-day -day looks like. So we know she's got some founder issues, so she probably is gonna have some good issues in the front end here, just compensating, but you never know. Sometimes you find some weird thing that you didn't realize was the reason 
to start the whole thing. So it just kind of depends <laughs> when they're this young baby brained, makes it a little bit harder because they're a little more impatient. But horse massage therapy, <laughs> it kind of looks like a lot of standing around. If you don't know what you're doing, um, it can look like I'm not doing much uh, just because depending on where I'm at with the horse, which muscle I'm working on, it takes very little pressure to a lot of pressure. Um, a lot of the reactions and releases that I look for and you get with massage are kind of the typical lick and chew, dropping their head, get a lot of like GI movements like bubble guts, uh, a lot of gas release, a lot of like softening eyes. Sometimes they'll even fall asleep. I've had a couple clients that their horses have forgotten that they were standing up and their head starts to drop and they kind of lose balance and they're like, oh yeah, I, I'm awake. I have to be here. And it's, it's pretty great. Oh yeah, does that feel good? Hi. Oh, thank you. That's, it's kind of crazy to think about. Um, I mean, their neck obviously is up here. Their vertebrae actually come down here. So I came down and I found their fifth vertebrae because their vertebrae usually about the size of your palm. She doesn't have any particular knots, just tightness all through the length of this muscle though. I kind of switch up techniques, try to get that release where she's letting me hold on to that whole muscle body. Good girl. Yeah, that's the... We like the flop. One of my favorite points to hit is back behind the scapula. I have to get underneath that shoulder blade, right deep into that spine. I know. Yeah, that's tender, huh? I try to do a lot with the lesson horses. Um, unfortunately, they're a little bit harder to schedule just because with a massage, just like when humans get a massage, you might be a little sore the next day. Ideally, you give them 24 to 48 hours off of working after they get a full body massage or even just treating a certain area if there's an injury, if I'm working a lot out of their system, you wanna give them some time off. So kind of just scheduling around when they're able, we're able to work with it and get them some time off and then rehabbing horses, I do as much as I can. Another thing you can always tell with massage is saddle fit. If they've been ridden consistently, you can tell based on how sensitive she is to the back. She hasn't had a saddle on since we've had her, but, well, since Lazy Bee has had her. <laughs> um, but clearly she's all this muscle fasciculation is twitching here, something's bothering her. As we get to the back of the horse, you can tell kind of what their discipline is more as far as if they're an English jumper, if they do barrels based on where they're tension is, where their stronger points are, where their weaker points are. You can tell which side they're more dominant on because their dominant side is actually the weaker side because they turn with the opposite side. Kylie's also broken at the moment. I do have a broken ankle. It's Casual. <laughs> it was other animal related. Yeah, there it is, huh? Whereas here, this is that thicker up to usually in a healthy adult horse is about eight inches thick back through here. Kind of their push, push button, push muscles. She's got a pretty good knot here, so. Oh, good girl. Get that big release, that lick and chew. Yep, pushing into it. You want more, more pressure. And if you listen, if you know what you're listening for, they tell you less or more, or what feels good and what doesn't. Slash therapy actually can help not only heal injuries, it can help prevent injuries. So the more we're able to prevent injuries and keep horses healthy and working, the less I feel that people will be like, eh, they can't work, send them off. Like, who cares, they're not, gonna do anything for me anymore, send them to auction or send them wherever. Whereas if we can keep them healthy, happier for longer, I mean, they'll be able to stay in their good homes and stay doing their jobs and enjoying their jobs because they feel good. Lazy Bee is amazing. They have done so much for their community and tried to do so as much as they can. They've gone above and beyond for not only the horses, but the people. Um, people in the community to be able to let them connect and 
be around the horses and it has been incredible for me myself to be able to be out here and be part of it and be able to give back to the community and the horses. And so many clients and volunteers have come out and whether it's they're having a bad day or they just wanted to come out and help, they always, everyone leaves with a smile. I'm yet to see someone here that's upset after being here for more than five, 10 minutes. That's exactly what I thought. Super tight all through the hips. Again, it's a compensation thing. She's been lame, foundering both front and both front feet. So she sore there, so she's offloading to the back, causing a lot of tension, a lot of soreness all through this back end. So there's nothing specifically as far as knots go that I'm finding today. She might probably find some next time once she's kind of relaxed and released that tension overall a little bit more, but Overall, not too bad for a first assessment. Uh, I'm clearing out the bed of my truck so we can go get some hay. So we have been buying hay uh, from this supplier for a few years now. Um, about a year ago, we decided to make this our sole hay provider. Um, reasons being that he always had hay available, it was always the same price, and the quality of the hay was is all, always outstanding. Um, we buy small bales, we also buy large 3x4, 1200 pound bales from him, uh, all grass. Uh, we do buy some alfalfa now and then. The alfalfa bales are usually about 95 pounds, so those ones are really heavy to schlep. <laughs> those ones uh, so Kelsey can't move those ones at all so I I move those ones but luckily we only get we might get two or three of those a month just to do refeeding um, but yeah so this is it So we got our hay and we're gonna go back to the rescue and unload it. Now we are gonna put the slow feeder net on our big bale. I gotta get it untangled and stretch it over the big bale. And this is, what does this do for the horse? so this makes them eat slower, makes them eat at a rate that more mimics the natural grazing. So we see it help a lot uh, with horses with ulcers. Um, and also for horses that are skinny and need to gain some weight, it makes it so they can always have access to feed. Hay's done for another week. My name is Boise Pearson. I volunteer a little bit and uh, do lessons once a week. When I volunteer, I'm usually picking up horse poop and uh, helping move gates and hay and uh, helping with the horses a little bit moving around, feeding them, that type of stuff. Uh, clean up at this property and the other property. Help put fences up occasionally. All that type of stuff. All the, all the normal stuff you, <laughs> that's all the work involved with doing horses. I originally started coming because it was lessons that were affordable. 
Um, but I've been impressed with the care they have for horses, right? I mean, they accumulate broken horses <laughs> and take good care of them, whatever that means, you know? And uh, some of them can do lessons and some of them can do a few lessons and some of them a little more. It impresses me that anybody would sign up to take care of broken animals and take care of them and help them as much as they can and ease them on when it's time and all that. So I, I really, you know, I started out just doing lessons, but I, I really fall in love with this place. It has been so great being out here at your facility and you're doing amazing, amazing work here and you definitely should be proud of, of yourselves and um, social media, you're doing a great job there too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was great having you guys out. It was, I, it was really wonderful to be able to show you kind of what we do and, and show you around our places. Yeah. Places, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's awesome. And um, one thing I do want to tell you is that you are officially invited to boot camp. <gasps> yes. Oh, oh, oh really? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I was not wow. expecting that. Awesome. No, you're officially oh, wow. officially invited. That so is awesome. we'll be Yay. seeing you in September. Kay. And Tennessee again. That's Are you gonna amazing. cry? You look like you're gonna cry. <laughs> and and your chances oh of getting that fifteen thousand dollar grant just went a little higher, wow. yeah. That's yes. amazing. Yes. Oh, cool. thank you so much. Yeah, no, I'm sweaty, I'm but excited. can I hug you? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, thank you. So we will see you oh, in Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Thank okay, so yeah. yeah. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Were you expecting that? No, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting that yeah, either. That's oh awesome. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I bet it was Audrey. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was our, yeah, it was our volunteer. Yeah. Okay, well you need to get that time off yeah, right then. Yeah, gotta get the time off, find a babysitter. Yeah. Wait, can we bring our kids? <laughs> oh, we, we should bring Janine. Oh, we could bring grandma. Yeah. yeah. She could go to Tennessee. Yeah. Can we bring our horses? <laughs> <laughs> We're just leaving Lazy Bee Equine Rescue and Sanctuary, and I'm really impressed with all the hard work that young couple's doing. They're doing a great job, and uh, you know they they're so passionate about their organization and are basically doing whatever it takes to make it make it happen and make it work. And I, it's great great being here and just building this strong network to help horses across the United States is so important and we need people like them within the network to protect horses when they have no other hope. Oh 100 percent and they were a little spread out they have like three different locations they have two locations with um, like horses that they rescue in the less ends and then they have a third pasture they lease for sanctuary horses, so that's that's quite a bit of spread out. It's challenging for them. If they yeah. can consolidate into one facility and put that money they're putting in all these different leases into one place, I think they're really do good. Um, they're doing really good anyway. They're doing really good anyways, but... I think, um, I think that would be the logical next step. I think that's the next step for the growth in their organization is to consolidate. This organization needs a home. It does. And they're making do with what they have. They're doing a really they're great job. They're doing an amazing job. And we actually told them that they are coming to boot camp. So We did. We invited them to boot camp. So we will see them in Tennessee at boot camp. And um, they're one of the organizations that has a chance at winning that $15,000 grant. Now, just because we didn't invite another organization doesn't mean we won't invite them later. So No, just means we knew we wanted yeah. this, this organization. Yeah. And coming here actually just reaffirmed that. Yeah, we we felt it before coming here that they would they would be one that would come to boot camp. After being here and seeing the work they're doing, uh, they're definitely coming to boot camp. And I can't wait to see them there. 